Aloha Church family, my name is Angelina and I'm excited to get to share with you today. We are continuing in our Sit, Walk, Stand series as we journey through the book of Ephesians together. And we are at the walking portion of this series, which means that there is a lot of instructions for us. And if you're anything like me, then you may not like people telling you what to do. But these are some great instructions actually, and I really do love this passage of scripture that we are going to dive into. But um, I know that for many people, it is a difficult passage. And in fact, it is a highly debated and misunderstood passage as well. So before we dive into it and get to the scripture, I like for us to play a little game. This is an individual game just for fun. There's no points or prizes or, or anything. And so this is how it will work is I will say a word and you identify how that word makes you feel. Um, and to help, we have a emoji feelings chart up. And I like this emoji feelings chart because sometimes I can't think of the words of how I'm feeling, but I can look at this chart and be like, yep, that's exactly how my face looks right now. So you can use a chart or you don't have to, it's completely up to you. So the, um, let's go. The first word, let's just try it out. The very first word is Christmas. Christmas, yep, so how does that make you feel? It might be warm and cozy and funny, happy. You might have great memories, you might feel nostalgic, or it might be a time of stress or sadness, okay? So that's what we're gonna do. The next word that we have coming up is rainy days. Yep, two words, rainy days. So again, yes, we had a lot of these in February. Um, it might be um, bring up feelings of warm and coziness, sleepiness. You might be thankful that, you don't, that the rain is watering your plants or your garden, okay? The next word is taxes. Yep, I switched it up on you there a little bit, taxes. And so, Taxes, you might be completely content with it. You might have everything all organized and in order. And so you're like, I'm good. No real feelings there. Or it might bring out like some, a bit of panic and stressfulness or like, oh great, I have to, that's coming right around the corner. I gotta get to it soon, okay? The next word is vacation. Vacation. Ah, it might be really peaceful. You might start remembering a vacation you recently had or thinking, I need one of those really soon. Okay, the next words, be careful, is husband or wife. That's husband or wife. Now, don't take this as a trick question. Be careful of your response depending on who you're sitting next to um, or who you're watching this with, but husband or wife, all right? The next word and our last word today is submit. That's submit, yep. All right, these are just words and yet there can be a lot of meaning and emotions behind these words. So today our passage is about marriage, but if you're not married, I don't want you to tune me out just yet because this passage is for you as well. Um, you are not excluded from this. In fact, this passage is for everyone because what often comes up with the topic of marriage is gender and order or households and relationships. And so that's for everyone. You'd be surprised how often this little passage here in Ephesians chapter five comes up when I talk to Christians or even non-Christians about gender roles, marriage, and the Bible. And sure enough, someone brings up the word submit. And it's from this very passage. Maybe this word submit is a loaded word for you and it is really causing a lot of angst in you because someone used it to control you or hurt you or harm you in some way, shape or form and it really left a bad taste in your mouth. And if that happened and you are here today or listening to this, I want you to know that I am sorry that it happened to you and that is not the intention or God's heart in this scripture at all. It is my sincere hope today to help bring some clarity to this passage. So before we get any further, I'd like us to take a couple of deep breaths and be open to what God might want to speak to us today, individually and corporately. He may use me in these words that I have prepared, or he may use a conversation that you have later on today. Whatever it is, I believe that God wants to speak to you. So let's take a deep breath and then we'll pray. Okay, thank you, Father, so much for your goodness and for your words. Um, thank you 
for your heart for us. I pray that our hearts are softened and open to grasp what you have to say, say to us and how you want to speak to us today. We lift these things up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So last week, Pastor Dale shared from the first half of Ephesians chapter 5. And we saw that there is a clear distinction between the old life and the new life, what people living in the light do and don't do. And he encouraged us to walk in love and walk together. And today I'm going to pick up right where he left off on this theme that's throughout Ephesians, the same theme of unity. In fact, the title of my, of my message today is Cultivate Unity. And that's because there are some specific instructions for us and how we can cultivate unity. In this passage, we will see that there are instructions for both husbands and wives, and there's explanation and reasoning and some history. But before we get to this, let's consider some of the context of this letter. And I will do my best to give you some context to widen our understanding. So what we've already known and established is that this is a letter from Paul to the church in Ephesus. Okay, so he's writing to this church in Ephesus, which is a growing and flourishing church. And Ephesus is currently under Roman rule, and there is a lot about Roman customs and culture that we must consider in order to get a richer and fuller picture of this scripture. For one thing, Ephesus, or Roman rule, is a patriarchal society and a hierarchical society in that there's a respected chain of command in all areas of society, from government, leadership, and which all of this chain of command is also carried over into the households. And it's a male-led society. And because of this patriarchy and hierarchy, there is a lot of honor, shame, and order and responsibility that friends and or that families and individuals and households actually carry. So this passage is dealing with the family unit. And the family unit in this context is not just husband, wife, and kids, but it also includes anyone who serves the family and works in the households of the family, such as it can include um, slaves or servants or people who are hired hands or help who help out in the fields or with animals. And so it is not uncommon for one's family's household to also include extended family members and other workers to help the family function. So we could really do a deep dive into what these households and shops physically look like. But for right now, we just need to know that household units include immediate family as well as anyone else who is regularly contributing to the household and to the family. Okay? So you still with me? All right. So what is happening here is that when the head of the household chooses to follow Jesus or chooses Christianity, then he automatically brings his whole households with him and his whole family on this faith journey. Or the reverse is also true, is that when slaves or workers or hired hands slowly begin following Jesus, then it's actually quickly spreading within the household and revival is happening within these households and these family units. Yes, Christianity is spreading. However, people, are look, um, people of those days would look down on Christians because Christianity is based on a Jewish man who died by crucifixion, which was the ultimate shame for, shameful death back in those days. So back to these households, these family units with workers and servants, many of whom in Ephesus are choosing to follow Jesus, but it's not easy navigating this new faith. In fact, there's a lot of tension with questions like, I want to follow Jesus, but what does this mean for my daily life? Or like, I want to follow Jesus, but now these other households are like judging me and looking down on me, and I'm not quite fitting in like I used to. Or my household is following Jesus and it feels different, but now what? What else do we do? So remember that there's order and respect and hierarchy and it's so important. But this new faith in Jesus is starting to make things feel different and they can't quite put their finger on it. And that is why the second half of Ephesians, Paul writes about the household order because that's where the tension is in their day. So God uses the current structure, which people already know and live in, and he uses it to honor himself. God, in fact, chooses to meet people where they are. And he doesn't change things, but he helps to provide 
purpose and meaning, which really is more transformational and more intense than anything else could ever be. And so for all of this to make sense, we're going to look at the last couple verses of chapter five first, because that's just how my mind works. I want to know why we're reading all of this. So we're going to look at verse 31. It says, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Paul takes this well-known image of marriage, which is already active and already present in their society, and he uses marriage to point to God. He's saying, hey, you know this whole thing about marriage, which in those days wasn't about love or all the romance and stuff, but was really just about genealogy and continuing the family name. Hence, it was common for older women, older men to marry younger women who could actually give them more children and had more childbearing years. Hopefully these children would be sons because that would bring about, um, about a sense of pride and hope for the family name. So what scripture is actually saying is, you know this whole thing about marriage where a man and a woman come together and they are united as one flesh? Well, it's not actually about you. This act of unity and oneness is actually all about God. It is simply an image of how united Christ and the church are to be. They are to be um, so united and fit so perfectly together that they actually operate as one unit. Now, if you could imagine for a minute with me that you're a wife, likely years younger than your husband, married to this man in an arranged marriage for the sole purpose of maintaining the household, his household, and continuing his family line. And now you're reading this letter, which is saying marriage is more than just genealogy and procreation. It is actually for unity. In fact, this highly intimate unity is all about the church and Christ. That man who died that shameful death on the cross and came back to life? Wow, that's huge. And so that is why we have this passage here in Ephesians 5. Okay, now to make even more sense of all this, Paul is purposely not changing anything about the household unit. He's leaving everything intact. However, he is purposely defining roles with more meaning and purpose. So let's get back on track to verse 21. Verse 21, and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is how we are filled with the Holy Spirit. As we, just as we heard last week, and this is my main point today, is mutual submission. Now, as we experienced earlier with the little game that we played, um, the word submission can invoke a wide range of emotions. But let's just be honest for a minute. This whole idea of submission is something that we actually subscribe to daily as a society in many different ways. It's this idea of willfully giving up my rights for a specific purpose. So if you've been to a restaurant, then you've submitted to their dress code and you eat whatever's on their menu and you trust the servers and the cooks to cook well for you and serve you well. And if you've flown on a plane, then you submit to their many rules of baggage weight limits, amounts of liquids in a carry-on, passports, TSA, and the whole gamut of things. And so we daily submit to driving rules and protocols, socially accepted standards and norms, and whatever else you can think of. And so what does this mutual submission really mean? It is that in every way I relate to you, I consider you more important than me. Okay, let's say that again. Let's let, let that sink in a little bit more. Is that in every way I relate to you, I consider you more important than me. So let's just pause there for a second because the first time I heard this, I was like, what? I don't know about that. I don't know if that's true. And I kind of questioned it. Um, but in reality, it's not that I'm saying or talking about oppression or abuse or someone's value or worth. It is not that I'm saying someone is more important than you. No, not at all. Absolutely not. The scripture here is making people to be of equal value, of equal dignity and equal purpose, equal everything because of Christ. 
it is because of Christ in me then I can actually begin to live in such a way. And so the opposite of mutual submission, that is considering others more important than me, would actually be in every way I relate to you, I consider me more important than you. Now, if I'm honest, that definitely does not sound good. That sounds selfish and harsh and belittling and prideful. So this idea and practice of mutual submission is the basis of the passage that because of Christ, we can and are able to submit to one another. This little tidbit of mutual submission would have definitely turned heads back then because there was nothing mutual in their society. Everything was hierarchy and position and power and honor. And yet God is calling for mutual submission. He is leveling the playing field. Okay, so let's continue on. In verse 22, it starts off with, for wives. So let's just pause there for a second. Um, because the fact that Paul is addressing wives first is an actual game changer. Because in a patriarchal society, you address the head of the household first. But nope, Paul addresses what is seen in their day as the lesser unit, the wife. Just as in chapter six, he's going to choose to address the slaves before the masters. Okay, so verse 22, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Paul grants purpose to what is already established. Yes, wives, you wives, you submit to your husbands and you, just as you have been, you choose to defer to them. But now it's not because of the hierarchy. You've already been doing that and you've already been playing that game. But now you're going to do this because you believe in God and there's a greater purpose and reasoning behind it all. So now if you thought that one line was rough, let's look at what is written to husbands. Okay. So continue on verse 23 for a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands and everything. Husbands, so this is specifically for husbands, not just any man um, is head over any woman, but specifically husbands here are compared to Christ as Christ is the head of the church. And I think a lot of people got this part wrong and it has done a lot of harm. In fact, I remember when I was in college visiting with extended family, one of my aunts had so said something like, you really do believe in all that Bible stuff, don't you? Like, I could never do that. All that stuff about women not being equal to men or submitting to men, all of that is not for me. And boy, did that really rock me and really get me questioning the Bible. And it really started my journey digging in deeper into scriptures. So it's not about women being lesser or submitting to men. No, it's about mutual submission between a husband and a wife. And if you've been married for any length of time, then you absolutely know that marriage does not work without mutuality and a specific order of things with love, respect, and submission as a base. So we cannot take any one line or part of scripture and think that that is it. We actually must compare it to other parts of scripture, which we will do in a minute to get a fuller understanding of what the scripture is saying. Verse 25 says, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. And he did this to, re to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or a wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, Husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it. Just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. Okay? So not only is, is there more instruction with, written for husbands than for wives, but this more is actually requiring husbands to serve their wives in a way. And if we were part of the church of Ephesus during this day and age, then this would be completely unheard of. The higher person would not be required to do something or anything or give something for the lesser. But here, husbands are called to love their wife like Christ loved the church. 
And it is specifically clear. Yes, just like Christ died for the church for our benefit, Jesus provided a way that we might be closer to God. And that's the kind of love that husbands are to have for their wives. So love your wife as you love your own body and care for her as you would care for yourself. Do we sense this shift of hierarchy here? It's a huge shift. It's no longer this hierarchy of pride, position, power that is lorded over the person below you. Rather, it takes the original household order and gives it greater purpose and achievement by saying, you know how the lesser was subordinate to the greater? Well, we're keeping the same order and structure, but now the hierarchy is shifting from power and rule to a hierarchy of service, where the one on top actually does the greatest amount of service. So we are starting to get this beautiful picture of mutual submission based on loving service for one another where a husband and wife choose to defer to each other and consider each other granting dignity to one another. Reminding us that husband and wife are one, united in body, and it brings us back to the bigger picture that we are all members of his body. All of this order and service and submission is never about us, but always about God. And I'm going to say it again, that all of this order and service and submission is never about us, but it's always about God. Okay, guys, we're almost there. We're getting to one of my favorite parts in here. It's verse 31. It says, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. And now, you know how I mentioned earlier that we actually use scripture to explain scripture and understand God's heart? Well, Jews of their day and age would read this verse and immediately recall when this verse was first used way back in Genesis chapter 2. And they would recall the creation account um, of what God did. They would remember how God created the world. And when he made Adam, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper that is suitable for him. So they would be reminded of God's intention for man and wife because this word helper in Genesis is the Hebrew word ezer. But Jewish customs actually have this word as ezer kigneto, which literally means the help that opposes. It describes this helper that is strong enough to lean against and rely on, that is sturdy and a sure foundation. This helper is this age this aid that is not optional, but completely necessary. It's like two people of equal weight and strength and stature leaning against each other and still being able to stand. And if you're questioning or unsure about all of this, we can look at um, scriptures and see other times that the word Ezra is actually used, this word for helper. There's many times throughout scriptures that it's used, but we'll look at a few. Exodus 18, four says, his son was named Eliezer. For Moses had said, the God of my ancestors was my helper. He rescued me from the sword of Pharaoh. So here, Moses is calling God his helper, not because God was lesser than Moses, but because God had helped Moses live another day. And then we have Deuteronomy 33, 26, where it says, there is no one like the God of Israel. He rides across the heavens to help you across the skies in majestic splendor. Yes, God helps us, not because we are greater than God, but actually because he is the greatest and he's the only one who can help. And then we also have Psalms. In Psalm 70 verse 5, it says, But as for me, I am poor and needy. Please hurry to my aid, O God. You are my helper and my savior. O Lord, do not delay. And then Psalm 121 verses 1 through 2, it says, I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And on and on and on throughout scripture. This helper is not an option. This helper is necessary. And it's actually often used to describe God as the one to turn to for ultimate help. 
In fact, last year we went through a series called The Helper, which is all about Holy Spirit, who is often referred to as the helper. Not because Holy Spirit is less than God or less than Jesus, they are all equal in power, but he is actually the only one who can provide the help that we need. And then we, and then we close out the chapter with verse 32. It says, this is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Husbands and wives are given purpose and dignity in their roles. And I just love how God reveals himself in our most intimate relationships. He truly meets us where we are. You know, this whole idea of mutual submission does not come easy to me, and I personally struggle with it. You see, I was raised by two strong, independent parents, and there are a lot of women in my family, and a lot of these women are strong, independent, loud, confident, decisive women. And so it was normal for me to learn how to do things on my own. Um, and when I was growing up, I remember my dad would always say, I don't want my daughter, I don't want you to have to rely on a man or depend on a man or anyone. So I learned how to do things for myself. Things like driving a stick shift, to changing a tire, to killing roaches, asking questions, to negotiating for things, and even traveling overseas all, all on my own. I never once thought there was something I couldn't do well on my own. And then came the time where Jared and I fall in love and get married. And boy, was there a learning curve to all of this. I had actually read this passage and studied it and agreed with it, um, this whole idea of order and marriage and submission. But knowing something intellectually versus putting it into practice is a huge difference. Have you ever heard that phrase that Jesus lives in my heart, but grandpa lives in my bones? Well, that's what kept coming up and coming out in our conversations and in our arguments. It was the parts of myself which wanted to remain a strong and independent person. So it took me a long, long time to start applying mutual submission to my marriage. I could get and understand the whole loving for and caring for and helping each other out, but the part that was really hard for me was learning to ask for Jared's opinion on things or that tension between sharing opposing opinions. I had heard those jokes that the wife is always right or happy wife, happy life, and I fully bought into it. There were just some things I could not understand why Jared did not see it my way or why he wouldn't ju just adjust his way to seeing things my way. And because of this pride in myself as a strong, independent woman, it really put a block or a blinder on where I was not able to humble myself enough to receive feedback from him. It could be on things like small things, such as sharing with Jared about a rift I had with a coworker and he would question me and I would be appalled that he would even want to ask me a question about anything and he didn't just adjust his views to see things from my see things from my perspective. Or it could be about me sharing an idea as we're brainstorming about family travel. And I was so prideful, I couldn't even hear or listen to his ideas. So yes, it's been a long journey and I would like to say that I have come a long way, but there is likely more to learn. So you'll probably just have to ask Jared or consult him on that. So you see, as the years are passing, I am continually learning new ways of deferring to Jared, of valuing him and his opinions. And the beautiful part of mutual submission is that he is learning to do the same thing at the same time. So I know that our marriage is not perfect, but through all of this valuing each other and deferring to one another and considering others as more important, and really remembering that all of this is not about us or about me, but it's actually about God. So through all of this, I've never felt more united and in sync with Jared in our marriage and in our parenting. And it truly is a game changer. This idea of love and respect and mutual submission may look different for each one of our, for each one of our households today. But when we keep to the main main point that it is mutual submission for the purpose of unity, 
I believe our marriages would begin to look like how Christ loves the church. That we would slowly see things morph and shift and people's hearts and intentions slowly start looking more and more and more like God's heart. So whatever your household currently looks like, whoever is part of your household, I wonder what is needed this week to create more unity. The goal and heart of God is for believers to cultivate unity, regardless if you are a husband or a wife or a son or daughter or father or mother or a roommate or friend or colleagues or just part of the same small group. Remember, the Ephesian households included many people and it looks very different. And so here is our for Monday is I would like you to consider others more important. Release yourself from being the most important and consider others first. One practical thing is to ask for someone's input or feedback and listen to what they have to say, even if it's an opposing opinion. Rather than get critical or get curious, just ask questions. Invite someone else into your decision-making process. Imagine what a bit of unity could create. I imagine a united household or family unit or a united group of friends would create a sense of peace and security that would grant us the ability and freedom to connect more intimately with God and capture His heart and provide a launching pad that could transform our community of Mililani at large because I believe that Jesus is coming back. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your hand and your covering over us. Thank you for the words that you've spoken and the words that you give us. Thank you for the way that you love us and you sent your son to die for us. I pray um, over our week ahead, over the days ahead, over the conversations ahead, that we can consider others important and have your heart for others. And um, might we be open to the way that we submit to one another um, because of you, for unity, because it's all about you. We lift these things up in Jesus' name. Amen.